Okay, well, yeah, I'm Elos, and uh, I guess I get to welcome you uh, properly to this thing. So, about me, uh, I used to be a teaching assistant, and uh, I do enjoy it, and I hope to get back to it one way or another. Uh, meanwhile, I'm working as a C++ developer, engineer, whatever they, whichever title they give me. But I do want to emphasize this teaching assistant uh, part of my career uh, because uh, my goal here is not to just go through my slides, but actually explain something and uh, leave you with some knowledge. So please, if you have any questions at any point, ask them right away. It's gonna be easier, I guess, for everyone. I do, uh, another thing is that I will explain some concepts on basically higher level and uh, leave you with some resources so you can dive deeper because I have a limited time. Now, the topic of class layout, why even talk about it? Well, we do often create classes on a daily basis, maybe even, and we don't often think about the class and the layout itself. Uh, the way I think most people approach creating classes, you write struct, you write, or a class, you write a name, you open brackets, close the brackets, and then you kind of treat it like a bag, you just throw stuff in there, like in any order, without thinking too much, and then like at one point you feel like it's too much, so you just shake it up a bit and you throw more stuff in there. Uh, first things first, you should probably learn solid principles if you do that, but that's not what this is about. Uh, this is more about uh, if you kind of not throw stuff in there, but put it down gently with some thought, you can possibly get a more useful bag. If this metaphor was not uh, understandable, hopefully by the end of this, it will be. So, yeah. The class is a bag, and then you have member variables and uh, member functions, and then some stuff is static, some is private, some is public, and all that stuff. Uh, and you kind of create something like this, right? We have uh, two integers, uh, three bools, one uh, double and one string, and we have two member and yeah, I see people are squinting, so I guess <laughs> not the most visible. Okay, so it's a struct, my struct. It has int value one, bool, uh, is value one set. Same thing for value two. And then in private, we have value three, which is a double. And then we have another bool for value three. And we have a string, uh, a public string name. We have get value three. Uh, public uh, member function, and we have set value three, uh, another public member function should be simple to understand. Uh, just uh, like a quick question, uh, how many of you are happy about this throw to the runtime error? No, no one is happy, cool. I ah, hope to get some discussion on that, but again, not topic. So, um, Non-static stuff doesn't really contribute to the size of the class, so we will not uh, focus on it. Uh, sorry, static uh, members don't contribute to the size of the class, so we will not talk about them. Member functions also don't contribute to the size and the layout of the class, so again, not here. And the uh, enums or uh, member or the classes that are defined uh, within the class have the same scope as the class itself. So again, the only thing that uh, matters for the, for the purpose of this presentation are the member variables, non-static member variables. And some stuff that uh, C++ guarantees to us is that uh, the object, when we create an object of a certain type, it's going to be sequential in memory, meaning the object is going to take just one chunk of memory and have everything there. It's not going to be cut into pieces and thrown all around. And the first uh, member variable is going to be at uh, zero offset from the position of the, of the object itself. Here, 
Again, if you didn't see the code, I don't know how well you're going to see this, but this is how you can imagine that uh, the class is going to be laid, the class that I showed previously is going to be laid out in memory. We're going to basically have the member variables in the order in which they are declared uh, one after another in memory. The red ones are the private ones, but it doesn't really uh, affect the layout. However, this is C++ and uh, things are never as they seem. So before C++ 11, we didn't really have too many uh, guarantees as in uh, what the layout is going to be. Then in C++11, we got the guarantee that uh, within the access scope, which would be all of the member variables that are between like private and, and public, like in the, in the same like access scope. I don't think we have like an actual name for that, but uh, it was guaranteed that they are going to be in the order in which they are declared. However, you're not guaranteed uh, the order of the blocks themselves. So the compiler could decide to do something like this, which is put everything that's public uh, first and then put the private stuff. This, as you can imagine, doesn't really make sense uh, because even if you get some performance benefits out of this, it's ABI hell and uh, like different compilers and different versions of compilers can decide to lay out the same class differently and it's just not good to work for, to work with. So in C++23, uh, there was a paper, and uh, if you look at the paper or just the conclusion, it just says, listen, it doesn't make, to, make sense to do this, and no one really did it because it doesn't make sense. So let's just put it in the standard that uh, member variables like need to be in the order in which they are declared, and now it's that way. Now, more from the C++ standard, the, the sub-objects. So there are these things that are sub-objects and uh, member objects, which are member variables or data members. We have, you know, more names because it makes communication simpler, right? Um, like, I will only, I will try to only use the term member variables. If I switch at one point, just know that that's what I mean. And uh, so there are member variables, base class sub-objects, and uh, there are also array elements and they are sub-objects. I will not focus on, on array elements. And of course, if there are sub-objects, then there are complete objects, which is basically whatever is not a sub-object. The next thing is that uh, each object needs to have a size, and that size needs to be greater than zero. Well, the CPP ref says that it needs to be non-zero, but uh, let's be honest, having size minus two doesn't really make sense. Like, you can grow your memory in that way. It should be amazing. Haven't we all tried to download some RAM at one point? And the final thing is that, yeah, don't like, don't even bother reading this. Uh, the whole point is that uh, if you have two objects of the same type and the same lifetime, they need to have distinct addresses, right? And this kind of come, works with this um, non-zero size because uh, if you uh, if the object says, let's say, like the the minimum size is one, so like if you have object at, the, of the, at this address and the size is one, then the next one is going to be at the next uh, address. This is all taken from the CPPRF, of course. Uh, I, like, are there any questions? No. Cool. Yes. So basically, sub-objects. What, uh, what I want to exercise are like three things. Sub-objects, uh, member uh, variables, and base classes for the purposes of layout are basically the same thing. Every object needs to have a size of uh, one, at least, or greater than one, and distinct ob objects need to have distinct addresses. There are exceptions, we will go through them, but this is the basic stuff. Another thing that we kind of require is the alignment. Uh, the 
every type has its uh, alignment requirement, and the simplest way to think about it is this. Uh, the address of the object of that type needs to be divisible by the alignment requirement. It's a nine size dint, and it's always a, a power of two. If uh, the address, the next available address, is not does not s satisfy the requirement, then uh, you're going to get some padding bytes and get the next address that uh, satisfies the requirement. Hopefully, this was all pretty much understandable. There are going to be exep examples to to better illustrate all of this, and that's again unreadable code. Cool. Uh, okay, so there are three structs. Uh, first is first base, second base, third base. First base has integer and the third base has also an integer and then there is a struct inheritance which just inherits from all three base classes. Any um, like assumptions about the size of this inheritance class? Not really, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, actually, yeah. It, it, it sort of is implementation defined. Uh, let's go. So the first one is four bytes. Ex uh, as expected, we have one int. Int is four bytes. But then again, it could depend on the architecture. So, you know. Second one is one. Now, the second one doesn't have any member variables. However, it needs some space. We said that uh, every object needs to have uh, size greater than zero. So we get this at least one byte. And the third one has size four. Again, same as the first one. So for the inheritance, we would expect like something close to nine. And we get eight. And, uh, yeah, well, I would say that uh, the day we decided that uh, writing x equals x plus 1, we just derailed from mathematics, and so 4 plus 1 plus 4 can be 8, so it's all good. So let's kind of go through this base class stuff. Uh, usually the space, so the objects, the sub-objects of the base classes are kind of within the object of the derived class. And those sub-objects are usually in the beginning, before the space for the derived uh, class object. And they are usually in the order in which, uh, you, in which you inherit. Now, I say usually here uh, only because it's not really uh, mandated by the standard. So again, the compiler can decide to do something different. Or like, if it is, uh, please feel free to correct me. And as mentioned, uh, empty stateless uh, classes require at least one byte. But there is this thing called the empty base class optimization, which basically says, uh, Listen, yeah, I have this object, uh, I have this class, uh, and it doesn't have any state, so it doesn't really require any space. So how about, how about I just share the space with one of the classes that actually require space? Because uh, if we uh, remember the rules, the rule is that the, object of the objects of the same type and the same lifetime uh, need to have distinct addresses. It doesn't really say that the objects of different types have to have distinct addresses. So doing an empty base class optimization is something that's accept acceptable. It's always funny to me when they call it an optimization, but it's actually required by the standard. But you know, and of course, it's uh, compiler dependent. As far as I know, the Microsoft uh, compiler behaves a bit differently, but it basically works on all three major compilers. Now, uh, as we've been told, uh, everything we can do with uh, inheritance, we can also do with composition. So now we have the same three base classes, but this time, uh, yeah, it's actually outside of the slide. Amazing. 
We have the class composition uh, that now has three member variables instead of three base classes, and the types are the same. The sizes of base classes are the same the, uh, as they were. But now, what do we expect for the size of the composition? 12. Okay, yeah, I heard a couple of 12s, and I guess you use more composition than inheritance. And yeah, it is 12. Now, the reason why it's 12, it's kind of obvious because the alignment requirement of the third base is 4. So if the first one is size 4 and then the second one is size 1, then we have three padding bytes to satisfy the alignment requirements of the third base. So we get a total size of 12. So they lied to us. We cannot do empty base class optimization with composition. Or can we? It's beautiful that it's outside of the slide. So there is this attribute, no unique address. And uh, the second base has this attribute. And let's see how that will impact the, the size and the layout of this class. First, second, third are still the same. But now the total size is eight. So we have managed to do empty base class optimization. Now, this uh, no unique address, I think uh, it was added in C20, and uh, it perfectly actually uh, explains what is going on here. It says that this uh, second base, this object of this second base, doesn't have any state, doesn't require any space, so it doesn't need a unique address. It needs an address, but the address can be shared with some other object. And there is this thing called the standard layout type. Um, the, now, the, the requirements for the standard layout type is that it doesn't have virtual base uh, classes or virtual functions. I, if it has base classes, all of them need to be of the standard layout type. If it has uh, member variables, then all of them need to be within the same base class or the most derived class. And if I have skipped something, yeah, and also like no two base classes uh, of the same type. And there is this uh, trait uh, studies standard layout where you can check if your uh, type is standard layout. Now, the, the, these requirements are basically just the consequences of the rules we talked about so far. Uh, if you have, um, let's say, member uh, variables of different access uh, levels, then the compiler can decide to move them around. Well, it could before C++ 23, and then the Layout is not standard. The, the fun thing about the like, standard layout is that it doesn't really prescribe what exactly is going to be the layout. It just says that it's, it's standardized. It's basically always going to be the same until you know, they decide to change the standard. And it basically uh, exists. Uh, it has all of these limitations be because of all the rules. And like I mentioned, even though they they changed that the compiler cannot uh, change the order of um, order of the access blocks. The requirement that all of the member variables still need to be in the same access block in the same class is there. So I guess we need another paper for this. It's just uh, the standard layout type just makes working uh, with the class easier in terms of communication with other uh, other programming languages. And yeah, like uh, also on like previous slides and the slides will be, I think, shared. There are Godbox links. You can go and play with uh, the examples yourselves if you want. And now uh, there, is a, there is a way to actually take a closer look at your class layout. So first off, there is this offset off, uh, which is from C, a macro that is going to give you the offset of the member variable within your object. 
but it's kind of limited. And all three major compilers actually have these flags. In Clang, it's dump record layouts. In G++ is dump class hierarchy, and in MSVC is report all class layout. These flags are actually more like uh, for compiler developers, they are more debug flags than something that you would use in your everyday life. But they are really fun to, to play with, although I have only worked with uh, Clang, uh, the Clang flag, simply because I used Clang for all the examples, so just to keep the things consistent. And this is something that uh, the Clang uh, would print out. On the left-hand side, there are these classes, first base, second base, and third base. And um, yeah, I shouldn't, but I'm going to walk to the other side because it's easier to point this way. So uh, uh, this is probably even worse for visibility. Like, can you at the, in the back see? Yeah, okay, I get some thumbs up, perfect. So uh, on, on this left side, uh, we see the offset of the member variable within the object. So now, obviously, like the first base, the object itself is going to be at a zero offset. And here we see that this int is going to be uh, at a zero offset also. This is, again, consistent with, uh, with what the uh, standard says, which is that the first member variable is going to be at a zero offset. And we see also that the size of this struct is four and the alignment is also four. There are these other things. I will not go into them here. Second base, well, the second base doesn't have anything. It's empty and it says here also that it's empty and it says that the size is one and the alignment is one. And then for the third base, we have the same situation as for the first one. Now for the the struct composition with no unique address. So we have the object of type first base, and then we see that like within the object of type first base, we have an integer, int uh, b, and that's at the zero offset because yeah, that's the only thing that's in the first base. And then at the uh, offset four, we have a second base, which is empty. And then at the offset eight, we have the third base. And we have the third basis uh, object uh, member uh, in C. And so if this is at the offset four and the size of the third base is four, like obviously the size is going the size of the entire object is going to be twelve, but the alignment requirement of this class is going to be eight uh, is go sorry, is going to be four and is going to be four because the alignment requirement of uh, structure is defined by the highest alignment requirement of its uh, member variable. In this case, that's uh, this int, well, either of these ints. And now we have this, uh, basically the same situation, but this time we are using no unique address, and now we see that the first base is the same, but we see that the second base uh, is at the offset zero. So basically the second base is sharing space, with the first base, but it actually doesn't require any space, so it's just there. It, it's basically, if you try to get the address of this second base, you're going to get the same ad address as the first, and which is basically the same address of the entire object. And for the third base, it's now at the offset four, so we are down to eight bytes for the size. And now we have this uh, inheritance, and it's a bit, uh, yeah, the text is not perfectly aligned. But if we go back to the composition within, uh, with no unique address, uh, you will notice that actually the layout of these two classes is identical. So the first base and the second are at zero, and the third base is at four, the size is eight, and the alignment is four. And we have the same thing here. First and second base are at zero, and the third base is at four, and the size of size of the entire class is eight, and the alignment requirement is four, which is 
kind of the whole point of my previous uh, mention that base class objects and member variables are for the purposes of the layout basically the same thing. And now we have half of the <laughs> my struct that was shown in the beginning. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's what happens when you don't check your slides the day before, after you come back from vacation. Nice. So, okay. I'm going to go to the other side again. So, my struct, the integer is as expected at uh, zero, the boolean is at four, and now the second integer is at eight, which means that we kind of wasted four bytes here. Sorry, three bytes. Well, the bool itself is, should be just one bit, so we have wasted like 31 bits for nothing. The, okay, the, the rest is as expected, but here we see the class uh, string, which is just basic string of type char name, and then we have within that, we have this uh, m data plus thing, which within itself has this uh, empty base uh, allocator, which is like new allocator, which is again an empty base, and there is a lot of stuff missing here. But uh, the fun thing is that, uh, yeah, like the examples are on Git and you can just play with them. Uh, like the examples along with the code, the, the command line that you need to execute them. So you can just play with them. But this is, uh, this is I think, the most fun part where you can just look at the entire layout of the string class and unfortunately we do not see the size but you actually see the union and the pointer if you have dynamically allocated data and small buffer optimization so yeah like not something you you would use in production it's most probably very slow but really cool for um, slideware i guess and now the, the thing that we care about the most, the only thing we care about, I would say, is the performance. How does this all impact the performance? Ah, yes, invisible code. Okay, I of course wrote the benchmark because I don't believe anything like, like anyone does. So we have these two structs. Uh, one is good data and the other is sinful data. Both of them have one integer and two bulls. Uh, however, in good data, uh, there is an int and then there are two bulls, which means we have only two bytes of padding at the end and the size of the entire struct is eight. On the simple data, we have a bool and then we have uh, an int and another bool, which means we have one bool, three padding bytes, int, three padding uh, bool, three padding bytes. 8 compared to, to 12, which is like 50% increase in size. Pretty terrible in itself, but we care about the performance. We have a lot of memory, right? Uh, now, they are pretty much like, okay, so for the rest of the stuff, uh, the constructors are the same and the operator less than. Uh, I wrote myself instead of generating uh, the spaceship operator simply because I use sort. And I want to make sure that uh, less than evaluates to the same thing so I don't get uh, more swaps in one case and that then that impacts the performance. So I did uh, now the I'm going to show you the graphs for this setup. I actually did uh, the same test on another setup on an older Intel uh, processor and the results are just wild there. Here uh, I used the uh, Ryzen, uh, it was on Manjaro, I used Google Benchmark because that's what everyone uses. Uh, for, for every uh, data point there were 100 iterations, just to make sure it's not some like one-off thing that happens. And uh, I varied the size from 1000 elements to 1 million elements and increased by 100 on, uh, in each step. And for the functions, uh, other than this uh, generate data, which I wrote myself, uh, everything else is just calls to the standards. So this is STD for each, STD sort, and STD accumulate. 
and the generate just creates a vector, reserves the space, and then randomly generates uh, values. I seed the round every time just to make sure that I get bo the same uh, values for both uh, good and sinful data. And now the graphs. This is generate. Doesn't really show much, does it? This would be, this is generate, but this is the relative speed up. Now you will, uh, the blue line is the good data, the one that's supposed to be better. And if the orange line is below it, that means that uh, simple data is actually better. And here we see that it actually is, it's like 6% better in the best case. However, you will notice that there is this like a uh, huge line here where the where the performances get pretty much the same and then like the further after a million elements it just takes too long to to run all this stuff so um when we get to a million the the performance is basically the same at that point we kind of can't really rely on cache and the compiler being smart we just like uh, rely on simply the, the the hardware itself. The other one is for each. Uh, now, you will notice here that uh, there are these jumps. Now, those jumps, I would assume, are the places where we get out of L1 and then L2 cache. And you will notice that the simple data gets out of uh, caches sooner than the good data, which is as we, we expect because it's 50% larger. And then there is just chaos when you go to the high values. Now, like the, the fun thing is that uh, Google Benchmark says that uh, you should write uh, your code so the data fits in the cache so you don't uh, get uh, this kind of stuff. But I actually want to test this kind of stuff because let's be honest, how often does all of your data fit in the cache? And this is the relative uh, performance. Again, the blue line is the good data. And you see these peaks. These are like the places where the sinful data gets out of the cache. And then once the good data is also out of the cache, they are basically the same. Up until you get completely out of cache. And then you just get these uh, huge performance differences in both ways, I would say. Sort, uh, yeah, sort kind of looks the best, uh, I think. Uh, so sort is pretty much consistently like a couple of percents up to 10% faster for the good data, except for this like very bad case, which like, I don't know what happens there, but you know, the compiler does strange things. And now the accumulate, which is like my favorite one of all these because it perfectly illustrates what I wanted to say. So you see the orange line just like skyrockets uh, compared to the blue line. And when you look at uh, relative, uh, relative difference, now you probably can't see the numbers because they are tiny because I just used some random Python script that I found online to generate these graphs that I couldn't uh, change. But uh, simple data gets basically up to four times worse in terms of performance when you do accumulate. And this is like, uh, you, you probably heard the saying measure before you optimize. Like you need to see what's your use case and what are the performance differences. With that, I have just uh, references for you. Now, I haven't talked about uh, virtual inheritance and virtual base class, virtual functions and all that stuff because I have limited time. The first talk from CPPCon 2020 goes, covers some of the stuff I talked about, but also goes into that part if you, if you wanna read that. Like these are the three pages from the CPPRF CPPRF is like a great place if you are looking for information, much better than Stack Overflow, but not so great for learning. So yeah, go to CPPRF when you 
need to. Software performance and class layout is a, a blog post from Johnny's Software Lab, written by Ivica, who is in the audience at this point. There you will see uh, more examples of how you can leverage the layout for the performance. And again, the emphasis is on, like, you need to know what exactly you want to do with your uh, class so you, can, uh, so you can optimize it properly. The three blog posts are about uh, compiler flags that were used for the class layout dumping stuff. And with that, I'm done. And we can move to the questions. My voice, oh, yes, I hear. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And we have lots of questions and pretty much time. OK, and <laughs> uh, I start from uh, questions from our chat. But after these questions, you have opportunity to uh, ask for microphone. Don't worry. Uh, OK, first question. You declare no, no virtual functions. Which way you propose runtime polymorphism? Propose. <laughs> Let's try it together. <laughs> yes, you declare no. <laughs> Everything will be OK. Runtime polymorphism. Uh, runtime polymorphism. Yeah, I don't, uh, <laughs> I don't really have a solution to that. This is just uh, like something that's, hmm, wait. Which slide was that about? Do you know? It's not written. It's not. Well, OK, right. I, don't, I don't have like an actual uh, answer for that, because it depends on what exactly the pro what's exactly the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, when it comes to virtual inheritance, like avoid it if you can. And if you can't, I don't know, try something like, mm, I mean, you can do something like dispatch, maybe. I, I, honestly, I can't think of anything at this point because I would need like an actual concrete problem that you are trying to solve, so I can maybe suggest a, a solution. It's like I'm not saying don't ever use virtual inheritance; just try not to use it uh, when you can because of you know performance and stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Move to the next one. Uh, does it mean that we should deprecate boost compressed pair after C++20 and use the attribute no unique address? Any guidelines for that? Uh, OK, so the only guideline I can give is uh, whenever you can rely just on the standard do it. I don't know what this boost thing is. Uh, what's it called? I mean, I haven't used it. So. Yes. This. Compressed pair. Ah, compressed pair. Yeah, uh, I mean, I would assume, like, does anyone know what the boost comp compressed pair is? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the answer was uh, the boost uh, compressed pair is a, is a way to use uh, empty base class optimization to basically do no unique address, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah the one of the... That's basically the technique that was used even in STL, uh, where you would, uh, if you have a base class, you would check if the class that you are uh, deriving from is, or are trying to use as a template argument is empty. And if it's empty, then you do uh, inheritance because you, do, you get the empty base class optimization. And if it's not uh, uh, empty, then you have a member variable. And now with no unique address, it's just simpler. You just write no unique address. I mean, I think you could just write no unique address on everything. It would make code ugly. But uh, you can write it anywhere. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't. And if it, do and if it does, it does. So it's like no cost, really. But yes, like rely on standard whenever you can, rather than uh, library. Dob dobro. Dobro. <laughs> voilà. uh, we have several questions about alignment. And I know that you have a very nice story. But let's start from the questions. Uh, what does the standard say about the alignment of object, objects inside arrays of data? Does it pad? the object size to the minimum minimal alignment of the type so that it would be possible to pack that in arrays? 
so like if I understood the question is does the does the does the standard uh, does the alignment in the array rate but alignment uh, that the object size yeah yeah uh, like as far as I know it does because the alignment requirement is on the object itself not on the the entire array so basically it is required that every object starts at the address that satisfies its uh, alignment requirement so yes another <laughs> question uh, the, does the probably once word does the standard specify any alignment requirements regarding bit fields? Bit fields? Well, I don't think so. Uh, like not that I know of, but if anyone knows anything, feel free to to speak up. Yeah, uh, can you just get the, the mic? Yeah, for example, you've got a uh, structure. Let's just imagine you have a floating point value. Technically, it's a structure of uh, uh, three fields. Yeah, yeah, three fields, but they are they have very like uh, tightly they they are tightly packed in uh, in non uh, power of two bits, right? So, what if I declare several fields, mark them as bit fields, like uh, colon number does the standard align them uh, does the compiler align such fields in a very specific way or just tightly pack does it make sense uh, yeah okay so i thought you you had an answer <laughs> but you're actually just repeating the question uh, i don't i haven't looked at the bit fields that much i've never really used them that much so i don't know like i would assume that uh, the compiler would try to to align the entire object, not the bit fields themselves, but like, don't hold my word for it. <laughs> Thank you. And could you tell your story? <laughs> yeah, sure. So yeah, we have eight minutes. It's a, almost a good story. Okay, so I didn't go into alignment uh, because I feel like if you're going to mess with alignment, uh, you really need to know what you're doing. And I have a point. I have a story that like illustrates it. First things first. Uh, for the alignment, let's just say you have a standard operators align off and align as. The line off is going to give you the alignment of the type, and the align as is going to set the alignment requirement of the type. But it has uh, a limit that it can only set a stricter requirement, meaning that if you have a four byte. And it also keeps uh, the rule that the alignment needs to be a power of two. So you can basically have a, a two byte, uh, sorry, a four byte aligned integer and set alignment requirement to eight or 16 or something like that. And like there is stuff like minimal uh, hardware interference and like all this stuff, but not to go into that. Uh, and then there is this thing called pragma push and pragma pop which allows you to set basically any alignment requirement. And it's a compiler intrinsic, so it's not really standardized. So technically, you can do something like uh, set the alignment requirement to one for everything, which means you are going to get the size of your, uh, of your types to be the minimum. There is going to be no padding. And that sounds great, like uh, you, you get uh, you get uh, le you use less space. Uh, the issue with that is that there are like the operating system also and the processor make some assumptions about the alignment of your data. So when I was preparing this talk first time for the CPP uh, meetup in Prague, uh, I watched the the CPP con talk that I reference here. And the guy says, um, like, did you notice how, like, in May, the amount of, uh, or June, the amount of bugs in your code uh, increases? Because that's when uh, the interns come and they just write <laughs> stuff that works without thinking too much. Uh, so, yeah, he talks about this Pragma stuff and how it's not really great and uh, the compiler can can choose whether it's going to follow the pragma or the align as stuff. But the whole point is kind of don't use this pragma stuff. 
And then a couple of days or weeks later, I go through our code base and I see pragma one, uh, push one, which is like set the alignment of everything to one. And I'm like, this is wrong, but I assume, and this is like, this, like never, assum never assume this, but I assume that the person who wrote this knows what they were doing. And I'm like, I'm not gonna touch it. I wasn't even looking for that. I was, I just happened to pass by. And I'm like, you know what? Like no one complained so far. I'm not gonna be the first to complain. Well, the, the funny thing happens uh, a couple of uh, weeks later, we get the issue from a customer. The, the software is crashing. And why is it crashing? Well, some variable that was used as a, as a synchronization, like some atomic or something like that, was within this uh, pragma stuff. It was misaligned. Now, I haven't went into the details, but I would assume that it was misaligned, so it was between two words. And uh, I would assume that if you have something that you are going to use atomically, you want only one operation to read and write. This was probably between two, and again, there were some parts that made the assumption that this is in one word, that it's properly aligned. It wasn't, the software was crashing, and you know, we had to fix it by just removing this stuff. So, like, don't use Pragma unless you know what you're doing, but you don't know what you're doing, so just don't do it, and everything is going to be fine, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you for your story, and we have little time, uh, and probably somebody would like to ask a question. No? no? Okay, okay. Uh, you can ask after, uh, you, you will be with us here, yes? Uh, you can yeah. ask <laughs> after presentation. Thank you very much, Milos. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you that you join us. Thank you. Thank you.